Assalamualaikum, salam Sarawakku sayang and a good day to you. The Chief Minister of Sarawak, Datuk Patinggi Dr. Abang Abdul Rahman Zohari bin Tun Datuk Abang Haji Openg recently announced our state budget worth 10.136 billion ringgit. This budget is to steer us out of this pandemic, well, this financial crisis, and also to lay strong foundations for our future. Now, Datuk Patinggi Abang Jo mentioned this in his speech, and I quite like this part. And he said, we don't know when COVID will end, but what we do know is where we want to be in the year 2030. I like that. The theme of the budget is united in building a resilient, an inclusive and a progressive society. But this was the first budget that wasn't tabled at the Dewan Undangan Negeri. Well, we're still in a state of emergency right now, that's why. Join me, Mona Manap, as we discuss the budget with policymakers and corporate leaders. And we'd like to find out how the budget will protect our livelihoods, how it will help businesses recover, well, at least for the year. And most important, how will our health be affected? Stay tuned for all the episodes of Econ Roundtable and we'll be discussing various topics in the budget. See you. Memang kita kurang pastilah sama ada yang adalah seimbang atau fungsi. Tapi kita akan nampak uh, keberkesanan yang dalam masa akan datang sama ada yang berkesan atau fungsi. But bagi kami, for sure kerajaan telah pun pola sehabis baik dalam uh, dalam menyeimbangkan endemik dan juga ekonomi rakyat dan juga negeri soal waktu lah. Today, let's have a look at the budget as an overall and look at the economic recovery and business outlook. And the best person to comment on this, and today we have him with us, Yang Berbahagia Professor Madia, Datuk Dr. Muhammad Abdullah bin Haji Zaidil. Thanks, Doc, for being with us today. He is the head of the Economic Planning Unit of Sarawak, and they're responsible in planning the budget, of course, with their team of people. We also have Datuk Dr. Philip Ting Ding Ying, uh, thanks, Dr. Philip, who represents the business fraternity in Sarawak. He is the vice president of the Sarawak Business Federation. He sits on the board of a few corporations like SMA, uh, EPF, I think just to name a few. And he runs his own business. And I think the latest one is uh, Cherry Tomatoes, I heard, <laughs> Dr. Philip. <laughs> um, right, so um, Dr. Muhammad, the yeah. first question, um, we'll start with you. Um, I remember an interview um, of Tan Sri Rafida Aziz uh, on BFM and how she was uh, lamenting about the national leaders focusing too much on the recovery and not enough on the future of the nation. But I think we need to inform her that Sarawak is a bit uh, ahead of the rest because we are not just focusing on the recovery right now. We're not planning just for the recovery. We already have a roadmap for the future and the roadmap is called the post covid uh, development Strategy 2030, right? So the PCDS. And um, this PC, the, the budget was formulated with the PCDS as a guide. Now, um, we have the stopgap measures, uh, recovery uh, for the economic recovery for businesses, and we also have the long term. Maybe you can explain a bit to us what is the balance between those two in the budget right now? Indeed, uh, we are actually uh, looking into the future rather than uh, addressing the current situation while so doing, uh, looking at especially for the, the next generation. So, if you look at the PCDS 2030, that stretch, uh -huh. we are looking at our economy to grow at about 6% uh, GDP growth uh, every year, which currently we are growing at about 35 to 4%. So to achieve that, we need to be we need to move outside our comfort zone, eh? meaning to say we need to to be a bit more bold in the way of we doing things and decision making and whatnot. And most importantly, this cannot be done only by the government. So this is economic uh, PCDS 2030. We're talking about a private driven 
uh, economy, you know, with the, the public sector just provide the facilitation. So, yes, a lot of things is in plan. Like, for example, uh, together with the PCDS, we're talking about hydrogen economy. Mm -hmm. We're talking about digital economy as mm -hmm. a driving force behind it. We're talking about circular economy. So, all this come into a package mm -hmm. where we, we want Sarawak to be uh, what do you call, ec uh, economically uh, pros prosper or economic prosperity, social in inclusivity, and uh, environment sustainable mm. uh, based on data and innovation. So that is the principle of PCDS, how we want to bring Sarawak to be a developed state by the year 2030. I hope I answer you, Mona. Yes, you've answered a lot of the questions already. Um, you mentioned about the 5 to 6% growth, um, and we'll get back to that a bit later. Um, and before we go to how the budget impacts the private sector, um, uh, you, you mentioned that you had your thoughts on this growth uh, of 5 to 6%. What do you think of it? Well, well thank, you very, thank you very much, Mona, for uh, having uh, me on this program. Uh, I'm the deputy president of uh, SBF and SCCI, <laughs> just to <laughs> correct that. Uh, okay, uh, the... Uh, the, the private sector is very excited about this, uh, the long-term plan that Sarawak has. And I think it's, uh, we, 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 we stand above uh, many of the other you know, uh, states or regions of Malaysia. And, I, and we'd like to congratulate the state government and the chief minister and the planning unit for coming up with that uh, master plan. The, um, the, the vision for, for the state to, to become a high-income society by the year 2030 encompasses uh, three major things from the private sector's point of view. The first one is that uh, we hope to achieve a household income of 10,000 ringgit per household. From the presently, we are right now presently, we are closer to about four, I think, yeah, but know, which is very, very important, you know. Yeah. So it was more than doubling of the household income. That's the point number one, that's measure number one. The second one is to uh, uh, improve the Gini coefficient yep. Yep. of the state. You know, there's been a lot of differences, uh, variation between the wealth in the cities versus the wealth in the rural areas, mm. and even the economic opportunities and wealth between the different racial groups in Sarawak. Mm. Yeah, so you know, again, right, this is something that uh, I think we fully, fully subscribe to that, and the private sector is very, very much supportive of that. Mm. Now, uh, the the to achieve uh, this high income uh, economy by the year 2030, we are really looking at a growth of roughly about 8% yeah. per annum. Yes. And for next year, 2022, we're looking at only a growth of 5 to 6%. Mm -hmm. So there is a very big gap, you know, yeah. uh, from 5 to 6% to 8 Okay. And don't forget, this is a compounding factor. Yeah. The fact that if you are lower growth in initial years, once you compound it, right, it makes the achievement of that high income society, 10,000 household income, a lot harder to achieve yeah. in the later years because of the compounding factor. We are, we are familiar with that. Yeah. And the private sector, uh, you know, the Sarah Business Federation, and the, 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 uh, we welcome uh, very much uh, the, the initiatives of the government. And we really, really look forward to uh, working more closely with the government and yourself, yeah. the Bula, yeah. you know, if we, we could, uh, we really, really am uh, very serious about uh, playing our role uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, achieve this uh, aim of a high income society of Sarawak yeah. by yeah. the year 2030. This COVID thing, you know, this, this COVID thing is, you know, we'll be done, we'll be, we'll, yes. we'll be done yeah. with that you know, in the next one or two years. So we shouldn't be focusing too much on yeah. that. You know, the moment you focus, you know, we, we should be looking at the forest rather than the trees. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we, okay. we shouldn't be. The fact that the Sarawak has got about 90% uh, vaccination rate for all its adult population is a really a big thing. It's a yeah. really a big achievement. Right? There's nothing much that can be done, and we thank the government yeah. for playing such a proactive role okay, to Dato, achieve that 90%. Um, yeah, I need to cut you there. Um, I think there's a lot of um, points that you mentioned that we're going to be discussing later. We're going to go on a short break, and we'll come back after this. I think the government is doing their best um, in helping the people to go through another day, especially those who have lost their job during the pandemic. Whether or not it is well balanced, we just have to wait and see.
Welcome back to the Econ Roundtable, Episode 1. So before the break, we were discussing about the 8% growth that you mentioned. Uh, Dr. Mohamad, you had something to add on to that. Yeah, thank you, Mona. Uh, that was a very, very well said uh, statement. 8%, uh, many, many out there argue that uh, can it be achieved? Uh, can it, will it just be another motherhood statement? You know? So the way I look at it from the planet point of view, 8% is achievable. Because uh, you look at China, in 1978, before 1978, their growth was only about uh, 6%. After, 78, after 1978, they grow as high as 13% GDP growth. They can go at an average about 8%. So that's over a stretch of 10 over years. We don't talk about China overall. We're talking about the provinces. You know? So we can, we can see that it can be done. You know? and, and, and how that does it? It, it's, it's based on its creativity. Uh, in the case of Sarawak, we're looking at uh, data and innovation as, as a driving force, considering the fact that we only have about 2.8 million population. So 8% GDP growth is possible. Indeed, for the next as year, maybe between uh, six, six to five to 6%, of course, it will go on a uh, gradual. So that's what I have to add. I, I believe 8% is achievable. We certainly hope so. Yeah. <laughs> the business sector is looking forward to that too. Yes, correct. Uh, so talking about the business sector, uh, how do you see the budget actually assisting them? There's about uh, 20 million given directly to Sarawak Business Federation. Uh, and there, there are other, I think, amounting up to about 500 million, I think, or half a billion. Uh, and, and there are none, you know, grants or none funds related or more on upskilling and reskilling. So there's a lot that we're doing to help the businesses. How do you see that from the business perspective? Okay, uh, first of all, I think the private sector, the business sector is very thankful to the government for this uh, wonderful budget. You know, whatever you see, I think the total, you're looking at a total budget of just over 10 billion ringgit uh, for next year. This on top of the 10 billion uh, for this year. So we are, we are very thankful. Uh, I had an opportunity at some stage to look at the, uh, the, the budget for Sarawak versus versus the other, some other states in peninsular Malaysia. From memory, I think Sarawak's budget was as big as the budgets of uh, Penang, Perak, Selangor, and Johor combined, you know? So, so we, we shouldn't really, really be complaining, you know, that uh, I think, I think the Sarawak has done extremely well. Uh, secondly, uh, the second thing which the, we in the Business Federation uh, noticed was that the allocation from the federal is very low in our total budget. It's something like about 200, just over 250 uh, million. It's really, really small. Uh, and we certainly hope that that figure could be a lot higher. So Sarawak, what Sarawak is doing is, is that we are relying a lot on our own uh, revenues, mainly principally from oil and gas. Now, if you look at the budgets, right, the oil and gas sector contributes just over 50% of our total uh, 10 uh, billion budget, you know. Uh, that a lot of that, you know, if we had if we had got more allocation from the federal, many of that could perhaps be diverted to building, you know, capacities in other areas of Sarawak and to uh, to, to enable us to achieve the eight percent growth per annum that we that we that we intend to uh, achieve, you know, based on our vision twenty thirty. Going back on the twenty million ringgit that uh, you mentioned, you know, the, the Sarawak Business Federation is a very very thankful to the government. This is this is the first time. I think that the I think the state government, you know, you know the chief minister have have heard our voices that uh, we do the business federation, which is made up of sixteen organisations in Sarawak, and we between us we probably employ roughly about eighty percent of all employees in the state, and we probably you know contribute roughly about eighty to ninety percent of the GDP of the state, excluding the government sector. Right? We're talking about the private sector right now. Okay, the private sector now. Uh, we are very, very thankful to that, and uh, we assure the government that we will uh, put it to great use. Uh, it was very specifically, we understand that uh, the 20 million is only for capacity building, as well as for entrepreneurship development. We will do that. Uh, we had a meeting by the Business Council on uh, how we in intend to uh, spend the 20 million. Uh, I think uh, they were based on that. And every one of the 16 associations within the Business Federation have been asked to come up with a business plan how they want to tap part of that uh, 20 million. We have made a few, and they all have to come up with that you know, by the middle of next month. They're given roughly about uh, 30 days to come up with that. And we can tell you one thing. A few uh, ideas have already been thrown out. 
Idea number one, uh, the money will not be going to the associations directly. It will be administered centrally and it has to be for those two objectives that was announced by the Chief Minister, capacity building and entrepreneurial development. It will not be going off to, uh, to, the, to every association. Number two, we kind of identified that data is very important uh, for, 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 the, for the private sector. So the one initiative we're looking at it right now is maybe for the for 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 the for the business federation to have a much much better data collection mechanism. You know, we probably need to employ data scientists. We need to employ a lot of surveyors to survey information. Uh, you know, data to collect data and you know, for us to uh, help the state uh, and for us to plan two years, three years, five years, ten years ahead of time. Uh, you know, uh, so data right now is pretty poor in the private sector. So we intend to maybe have some kind of data uh, collection uh, centers for that. We also realized that, uh, you know, the, in the private sector, you know, about half of the associations, about seven or eight of the associations relates to young people, so like the Sarawak you know, IT Association, Sarawak E-Commerce Association, Sarawak you know, Entrepreneur Association, Sarawak. Uh, so these are mainly a lot of young, young people. And uh, we in the Business Federation felt that the most senior members, you know, people in the DUBS, people like in the Sarawak Chamber of Commerce, people like in the Sarawak Pramo Association, we have an obligation. We have an obligation to mentor the younger people of Sarawak because the future is them. Okay. And, you know, you know, so we probably will come up with some kind of program, a mentorship program whereby the, 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 the more established people act as mentors. And we also have a coaching program. We could get a lot of coaches to coach the younger people of Sarawak to take over the baton from the older people into Industry 4.0 and what the government and what the state intends to achieve in the year 2030. So some kind of uh, you know, uh, dedication to mentorship and coaching programs will probably be on the table right now. Thanks, Dr. Philip. And it looks like uh, SBF has already a plan of execution for, for the amount of money that they're given. Um, and um, we will go into the execution of the budget itself. Um, and I'll be asking Dr. Abdullah Zaidil on how they are going to execute and what are the control and monitoring mechanism in that. We'll come right back after the break. Welcome back to the Econ Roundtable, Episode 1. Um, before we left off just now, we were talking about the implementation from the Sharp Business Federation. Now we go on to the implementation of the budget itself. So when the budget is announced, usually, well, me included, we have our concerns about the execution of it. Now on the federal side, they have Laksana, who acts as a reporting body or unit. Uh, it's not so much monitoring, it's more of reporting, and probably that's as close as they can get. Uh, but you mentioned in Sarawak, we have the Sarawak, the State Implementation Monitoring Unit, SIMU, and I think that's a bit bigger than just reporting. Tell us a bit more about that and how can that ensure that the budget will reach the people that it is intended to reach? Hmm. Okay, uh, first and foremost, uh, our budget recently announced by Honourable Chief Minister looking at about 10.6 over billion. So we're looking at about 600 over million in, uh, in, in, in deficit. So basically our budget is an expansionary budget. Expansion, expansionary budget not, doesn't mean it's a negative. You know? It doesn't mean it's a bad news or whatnot. Uh, but because different, uh, what do you call economic school of thought have different. Uh? Like for example, uh, the Keynesian uh, or Keynesian uh, school of thought, they, they, they prefer is a counter cyclical sort of approach. Whereby if the economy is on a downturn, then we should go on a deficit. When the economy is on the upturn, we should be on the su a surplus. So this is a counter cyclical. So it, it is what Sarawak is doing is normal. It's, it's a practice. 
Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. So that will hopefully ensure that all, all the, the funding that's allocated for certain areas or for rural development, even for the urban, will actually go towards um, what the beneficiaries actually need. So this covers people in uh, Bakalalan, in you know Belaga, um, or even close up here, Kampung Patong, uh, off of Kuching. Uh, let's hope for that. And um, talking about... Uh, implementing the budget and making sure that we actually stimulate the economy is not just the responsibility of the government, it's also the private sector. And you mentioned that before. Uh, perhaps you'd like to talk a bit more about that, Dr. Philip. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> the, the private sector is always, uh, you know, as, as you know, the private sector, you know, everything wants to be done by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Now, the private sector actually is uh, very keen to maybe request the government to reactivate some kind of mechanism. You know, we had, previously we had Samuda. You know, there's something to be Samuda. You know, whatever it is, the mechanism for the private sector to hold regular dialogues engagement. with uh, engagement and dialogue with the government. And maybe once every two months, once maybe once every two months or so. And uh, the private sector will then uh, come up with uh, the laundry list of issues that they have with the implementation, not only of the budget, but everything else in the state, where there are bottlenecks, you know, to, for, to achieving uh, the, the objectives of the private sector, they'll bring it up. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, we're hoping that the government could uh, listen to all of that and, you know, and two months later on, come back with some kind of uh, reports as to how it is, all this, you know, log jam is being cleared. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. And um, I agree with you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Philip. Businesses are not in the business of getting aid. We're not a charity. <laughs> we just want business to happen, right? Um, and um, I'd like to go back to Dr. Abdullah. Um, you mentioned about uh, the, the budget now is based on uh, an expansionary fiscal policy. Yeah. Uh, so that means we'll be in deficit perhaps for a few more years. Um, but how do we actually, uh, how do we plan to earn back and cover those deficits? I, back to differ. I don't think we will be going on and on uh, on our uh, deficit budget, you know. Because uh, you look at the current deficit, it's only about 600 million, you know. And, uh, and looking at the economy to grow between 5 to 6% uh, the year 2022. So this is in line with uh, international uh, or world economic growth. Huh? So with that, we interpolate and we expect the economy to our state economy, which is uh, export-driven, uh, commodity export. So we're looking at between five to six percent. So if we look at a five point six percent, five to six percent growth, we are already having in 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 excess. It's a plus already in terms of revenue. So I believe going forward, Sarawak will be in a balanced budget but this is because of the what happened last year uh, uh, and this year uh, that, that we need to be in a uh, what you call a deficit because in order to support the, the expenditure that we we uh, you know uh, unexpected expenditure we need to spend uh, in 2020 and 2021 so going forward 2022 we therefore we are in a deficit but going forward 2023 i believe we should be back in balanced uh, budget strategy yeah. All right, so thank you, Dr. Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Philip Ting for being with us today. The Sarawak Budget 2022 of 10.136 billion ringgit aims to help us all recover through the pandemic as well as plan for the future. So it's not just for now, it's for the future. But it's not just the Sarawak government doing everything. We must all do our part. Let's do this together. So see you on the second episode of the Econ Roundtable. My name is Mona signing off. See you then.